Well, hey guys, we are recording part two of the Proxmox, uh, the Lenovo P310 Proxmox walkthrough, I guess you could call it, um, videos. So in the last video, we installed um, Proxmox and then also TrueNAS Scale, as well as Portainer, and then um, spooled up a WireGuard server container. Uh, but there was a few weird things that happened, so we're going to start this video by explaining some of the mistakes I made and um, some tweaks I made. And then we'll also install a Windows Virtual Machine that will pass through our GTX 1650 Super um, 2. Super 2? That sounded funny. Anyways, we will pass through our graphics card to a Windows Virtual Machine that we will use um, with Parsec to do some remote gaming and also install Jellyfin so that way we can take advantage of the GPU. If you haven't watched the first part, make sure and it'll be somewhere. Make sure and watch part one of this video where I'll talk about the whole first part of this, getting everything set up uh, with what we have so far. So make sure you've watched part one. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna jump into part two here. If you didn't watch part one and you're just wanting to watch this part, just know this probably won't be the most concise tutorial, but what this video is sort of meant to be is more of taking a look at how I would approach setting something like this up without necessarily having all the answers. So it's gonna be a little bit of me figuring things out along the way, but hopefully that'll be helpful for someone like you that may be uh, not so much of an expert when it comes to Linux or virtualization or networking or things like that, because I am also not an expert with those things. So this is sort of the process of how I figure it out and have fun doing it. So let's go ahead and hop over here to our Proxmox. I'll get my face out of the way. And I'll talk through a couple of the first changes I made. Um, these are very, very small, but I didn't set up either of our two VMs. Our, oh, I didn't double click you. Um, we have our TrueNAS virtual machine here and our Debian virtual machine. Both of these were set to no at start at boot. So I switched that to yes. And then I also switched our um, this start and shutdown order. So um, our TrueNAS is order one and then Debian is order two. And then there's a, a little window here where it'll wait to spool up. So that way our TrueNAS um, virtual machine has time to spin up before our Debian machine that's gonna be potentially accessing that. And another quick thing here, I'm remoted into our prox deb machine. When we took a look at our FS tab here, I, I mentioned in that video in a note that I forgot to add a few arguments. First, I forgot to add this UID and GID. That's our user ID and group ID. We need this for file permissions. Um, and then we also added this no auto and x dash systemd dot auto mount. So this no auto actually kind of, in a way, defeats the purpose of the FS tab, which is here to automatically mount locations, and generate mounts, I guess, um, but mount file systems either at boot or when you run the mount dash a command. So this actually keeps that from not happening. And the reason I'm running that is because this x dash systemd dot auto mount will essentially mount to this point whenever it's a, you know something tries to access it. So if I do a list command or if if any other user or application or program tries to access this mount point, at that point it will go ahead and mount to it. And so I ran into a few issues with Debian recently auto mounting to SMB shares, and this seems to work. And I just completely forgot to put this in originally. So that's what I did. And so I actually haven't mounted this or anything. This this booted up like normal. So hopefully if I go to list our, our mount location here, proc share, and I click on this, you see it takes just a second, but then here's all of our stuff. I actually even copied over something earlier to test something. So this will automatically mount when anything tries to access anything on our share, which is great. That's what we want. So happy day. I think that's most of the things I need to cover. Oh, no. WireGuard. So if I go over here to Portainer, we can see a few things. Um, first of all, I changed this port, where is it at? Server port down here to 51821. And that is only because I'm concurrently running WireGuard on a different machine that's using port 51820. So I changed this here. I also had to change the actual port mapping. So it's 51821 to 51820. And then handled port forwarding the same on my router so that port 51821 gets forwarded to 51821 on this host machine, but then that gets mapped to 51820 in WireGuard, which it has to be 51820 on the container side. 
And then I also set up this server URL here. Um, and what that is, is this havenwg or wireguard.duckdns.org. Because in the other video, I completely forgot to set up a domain and it was just using our dynamic IP address. And that could be an issue because it's a dynamic IP address, so it's gonna be changing. And so while it worked temporarily, if our router restarted or for whatever reason, our um, IP address got changed by our internet service provider, our WireGuard tunnel would break. So what we're gonna do here instead is set up dynamic DNS. And we're gonna use duck DNS just because I've used it in the past and I'm familiar with it. I'm actually gonna put my face up here so it's one less thing I have to blur out. But you can see we have this, um, eh, I'll just blur it out. We have this Haven WireGuard domain, so that's where we get the Haven wg.duckdns.org. And we can see, or you can't see, I can see my current IP. And I could go to this website and hit update IP, and oh, okay, it logged me out. Uh, if I hit update IP, it will update the IP address manually, which it, it hasn't updated, so it should remain the same IP address that you still can't see. Um, but that's not very helpful. We want it to automatically update anytime our IP address changes. So what we can do is pull up another container, and we're going to use the Linux server.io version as well here because they are pretty well maintained and pretty simple. And we're going to once again scroll down to the Docker CLI, and I'm going to pull up a portainer as well. And we will go back to local containers and I'll keep this stopped for now. We're going to add container. We'll call it Doug DNS. And once again, we'll just kind of do what we did before. So the image we will copy this. I don't think there's any network port mappings. So we'll come down here should just be environment variables. And so we'll need to do this PUID. We'll just do this the same way we did before. It says it's optional and it probably is, but we'll play it safe. So PUID, PGID. I'm gonna make sure all these are capitalized this time so I don't make the same mistake I made before. TZ, we'll do America, Chicago. I don't know why I said it like that. I regret that. And then subdomains, and this is important. I'm going to put my Haven WG subdomain that I made. And then token is very important and not optional. We gotta have this. And this token comes from DuckDNS up here that I should hopefully have all this blurred out, but I can copy this token, go back, once again, paste it. And then I don't think we need anything else. We don't have a, we don't need anything in our config folder. So I believe this can all just stay the same. Log file, don't really care. We can just look at the Docker logs probably for now. Um, and then we need to set a restart policy. You don't have to set this the way they have it, but restart and less stop is typically what I like to do. Okay, so we should be good. We can hit, oh my gosh, I always lose the, where this is at. This UI is weird to me. It's strange that this is above the advanced container settings, but yeah, it's kind of strange. Okay, we'll deploy the container. And then it's running, we can go to the logs. And if we scroll down, we can see our IP was updated Sunday, November 6th at this time, which is what it is. Cool, so now uh, basically this container will just keep running and anytime it senses, it doesn't sense, anytime it notices that our IP address changes, it'll just keep you know checking routinely every few seconds or so. But anytime it notices that our public IP address changes, it'll update the DuckDNS servers, website, database, whatever. So then our havenwg.duckdns.org will route back to our new public IP address. So when we set up a WireGuard, we don't have to put in a IP address, we put in a domain name, and then that would resolve to our IP address. Make sense? Maybe, I don't know. If not, I didn't explain it well enough. So we should be good now. We can, um, I'm not gonna go back into the WireGuard container much here because yeah, we, we pretty much got it set up. I just had to make a few tweaks there. So hopefully that helped. And hopefully if you followed the first video, this answered some of the weird questions on that. So we'll hit start. All right, looking at the logs, we see all of this. Server mode is selected. External server address is set to haven, wg.dns.org. We can see our external port is 51821. 
and we made sure to map that port to 51820. So this all looks good, and I will really quickly check on my phone here. Hey, it worked. I don't want to show this because I'm tired of blurring this out and resetting it every time, but my phone is connected over cellular right now to my WireGuard server. So that's pretty cool. So I could access, like I showed before, I could access any of our servers or anything like that on our network from, from wherever. So I have an AirPod in. I've had an AirPod in this whole time. These videos are rough, man. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I think that was all of the fixes that I needed to come back to from the previous video. So now we're going to go ahead and get started with Windows, which is a little tricky. There's a lot when it comes to trying to pass through the GPUs properly and everything. So we're gonna go through that process and I'll kind of show you how I figured out those answers and, and made it work. Really quickly, I should note that I currently have my graphics card plugged into a monitor behind the screen, you can't see it, but it's probably important once we get into this that you actually have your graphics card plugged into something. Um, and if you don't wanna actually plug it into a monitor, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for a virtual machine server, you may actually need to use a little um, adapter guy like this. Oh, this is a really small camera angle. It's not very helpful. A little uh, HDMI dummy plug. Um, these are pretty cheap, you can get them on Amazon. Uh, but you can plug this in just to make sure there's actually a display d device connected. Uh, you may need to do that for your graphics card to work properly. So I almost forgot. I just wanted to mention it now. But let's hop back into server stuff. Okay, so I'm actually over here on Reddit. Um, this guide is pretty great. I don't know who you are, CJ Alas, but I appreciate you. Uh, this is a really good guide. It explains a lot of getting uh, GPU PCIe pass-through set up with Windows, and so we will be following quite a bit of this. And as you can see here, um, part of this is configuring IOMMU, which is really hard to say for me, IOMMU. Um, but yeah, we have this nano slash etc default grub. We did this whole thing. We added the Intel IOMMU on, and that is good, but we have a few more things we will need to do. There's a few things I didn't have to do, so I'm going to skip a few of these these commands here. Um, I don't think I need those. I don't remember needing those with the setup. So we will go down to a few more things here. Um, we will need to set up these VFIO modules. So to do that, we'll just open up our prox server, proxmox server here. And, oh, what is it? I'm going to pull this up side by side. Okay. So we need to go to etc modules. And we're going to copy paste all of these in. Now, if you ask me what all of these things do, I don't really know. That's why I'm following this guide. Uh, I understand some of it and I read into a little bit of it, but I don't understand it all. And that's what's cool about the internet is people know more than me and they answer these questions. So we're just going to trust them because I tested this at one point. It was like a few weeks back and it worked. But yeah, we'll just hit control X and then Y for yes. In the meantime, I'm actually probably going to hop over to Proxmox here and upload our Windows installer because that's gonna take a little bit. So we'll go to our local machine here. I'm gonna go ahead and remove actually these two just so we're not taking up space with these old images. And I'm gonna hit upload and I'm just gonna upload a Windows 10 ISO that I have here. And you might be wondering why I'm using Windows 10 and not Windows 11. Uh, I actually set this up originally with Windows 11, but it took a little bit more tinkering. It worked fine, um, but I'm not a huge fan of the install process and having to set up an account. And yeah, I just thought it'd be easier to do Windows 10, skip a lot of the install process with their account by just not having a network adapter. So yeah, we're gonna use Windows 10, you can use Windows 11, just know. There's actually a really good video, I forgot who it's by. I'll put a link in the description though. There's a really good video on getting this set up with Windows 11. So I'll make sure and put a link and reference that. Um, so if you wanna do this with Windows 11, check that out. But for now, we're going to keep letting that upload. And we'll go back here and keep doing this. Okay, and then we're going to run these commands now just in the shell. So run these echo commands. Oh my goodness. Maybe it does not want me to copy this line. Okay, there we go. Okay, we need to blacklist drivers and this is to keep, as far as I understand, um, our Proxmox 
server from actually using our graphics cards in any way. We could just run the NVIDIA command here, but since, I don't know, just to be safe, we're going to run all of these. And then we need to actually, well, I think at this point we actually need to get our Windows machine up and running because we'll need to start adding stuff to our VM. No, actually we can create it down here, I guess. So I think this is just to figure out which device we're looking at. So we can uh, list our PCIe devices here and I can scroll through and eventually I'll see, I actually scrolled right to it. That was impressive. We have this VGA compatible controller, NVIDIA Corporation, TU116, GeForce, GTX 1650 Super. Why am I still talking? But we have this graphics card here. We can see that device. We also see that there's a few other devices here under it. We have this um, VGA compatible controller, but then we also have an audio device. And it's also possible your graphics card may have something like a USB controller or something like that. And so what you'll see is you'll see multiple devices here all under this this first PCIe device, but with multiple, I'm not sure the addresses, lanes, I'm not entirely sure um, how that works, but I should know. I've researched a little bit for this video. Anyway, you will see this 01 colon 00. That's what we're looking for. This first one that says VGA compatible controller. Now, um, fortunately, this command is correct for us. Um, you would not copy paste this if this was not the device, but for us, it's the device, so we can actually just paste that in. And then we get this list out here, which is the vendor IDs, I believe. Yeah, vendor IDs. So we'll have one for the GPU, one for the audio bus. Okay, I had to reread this just a little bit to make sure I remember what I was doing, but we want to keep these codes here. So what we're gonna do is copy this command going to bring up notepad, copy it in. And then what we want to do is here where it says IDs, we're going to replace this with, I believe we only need these first two, but maybe not. I can't remember because I don't really know. Okay. So we have our two IDs here now. I believe this is correct. I think I think when I did this before, I actually went ahead and just copied all of these over. And so I think that's what I'm gonna do now, just to be safe. Okay, so basically I have this command that I copied, but I replaced all of the IDs here into this command. And so I'm just gonna copy this entire thing now. Hit copy, right, pl right click, hit enter, and then we'll run this update command. And we'll wait here for just a second while this runs. Okay, and I believe we should be good to hit reset. I'm not sure if we actually need to completely reboot this. I'm actually not sure if I need to actually do a real restart or just run that reset command. To be safe, I'm just gonna run reboot. And we'll sit here and wait a while until this machine boots up. So I'll see you then. Actually, in the meantime, there is something we can do we will need our vert IO drivers for Windows. And so we should be able to search. Um, I forgot exactly where to get it. Okay, down here, there's a link for download the latest stable ISO of the vert IO drivers, which I just did. So I'm gonna go back to Proxmox really quick. I believe this should be, oh, well, that's unfortunate. Our Proxmox server didn't restart, it just shut down. So we have to wait a little while. Darn. All right, we're back. And I actually went ahead and uploaded the vert IO drivers to Proxmox while we were waiting. Um, and so I think we're all good to go. We're gonna go back to this guide here. And there, we can go ahead and create the virtual machine actually. Um, we have some example menu screens, so I'm just gonna go through these. This one should be fine. This one should be fine. I'll probably come back to this one to make sure I have it right. But we can go to Proxmox here. I'll actually just do a half a screen. We'll go create VM and VM ID 102, that's good. Advanced, we'll go ahead and hit start it. Uh, no, we'll leave that off for now, we'll fix it in a bit. For OS, um, for our ISO, we're gonna do this Windows 10 and type. We need to make sure it's Microsoft Windows. 
And then I believe, hmm, let's go with version 11 2022. When I did this before and I did it with Windows 11, I used this. Um, this is an older guide. And so I believe, I think we'll be fine going with 11 2022. <laughs> If not, this video might get rough. So system, we want this to be Q35, and we're going to use this vert IO SCSI. Uh, this is all correct. Uh, I probably should do. Well, this is a little different. TPM storage, um, we'll put this on local VM. EFI storage, local VM as well. I did all this before and that looks right. Okay. And then for disks, this is where I'm probably going to check out this image just to make sure. We're going to do a SCSI. Uh, well, let's make this. We're going to make this pretty small. We'll do 120. And we want to do SSD emulation, IO thread, I guess. And then skip replication. I'm just going to trust. Uh, this is tricky. No backup, backup. So I believe we're correct here. And then cache. Um, it says right back. We'll we'll trust that, I guess. And I believe everything else is correct. We can hit next. And here, I don't think I need to copy this. That's just going to be. Well, we'll uh, we'll follow some of this stuff. Why not? Let's trust people that know more than me. We are going to do. Uh, let's do six cores. Um, this is all KVM, so it's not actually tied to our CPU. We have eight threads. Um, we'll run this as six cores. I believe that should be fine. We could, ah, let's just do four. We'll do four. Uh, CPU units, 1024. I guess we'll enable NUMA. And then I'm just going to leave, okay, I think we'll just leave all of this as is. I think this is all good. We'll just hit next. Memory. I should, should be able to do... 16384. Copy that. Give it 16 gigs. And then for network, um, we're actually going to do no network device here, I believe, right? I'm just going to double check myself. Oh, I'm nope. I'm dumb. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I double checked myself. This would have been an awkward video. We're going to change this though from the um, I said I was thinking no network device because we're going to use vert IO, not a virtualized NIC. Well, I guess this is a virtualized NIC, but we're not going to emulate an Intel NIC or a Realtek NIC. Uh, bridge, we will do, yes, this one bridge we have. And I believe we can leave this all the same. We'll hit next. And then this all, I think, is good. We're going to hit finish. And then before starting that up, I believe now... We can go here, uh, create VM, we did that. We already downloaded the vertio drivers. We need to enable OMVF for the VM. So under options, I think we need to add, okay, we'll go ahead and put our boot order here with our CD-ROM first, just to make sure. SCSI control for vertio SCSI single, is that not? I feel like we already did that. This seems this seems a little old. I think we already did all of this in the setup. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I think we already did all of this correctly. And then we'll need to edit the VM config file. So this is what I was more concerned about. Reconnect, and then we need to, in our prox machine, go to, let's copy this. Oh, um, so we'll just do, and then we'll put our ID here, which should be 102.conf. And we're going to change a few things here. What we're going to do is copy. We don't need to copy this first one because we already have, I think this is because of the newer Windows version of the machine, the Q35. We, we already have this here, so I'm pretty sure we can keep that. So we'll copy this and come down here to the bottom and paste those in. We'll see if this works. I really hope this works. 
I'm a little nervous that I might be copying two different guides right now and kind of in between things. But I believe we should be good with that. We can go back to Proxmox now. And under hardware, we're actually gonna pass through our PCIe device. We're gonna add PCIe device or PCI device. And then here we're going to pass through, I believe, both of our devices. Uh, we're not gonna check primary GPU yet, I don't believe. Yes, I don't believe we need to pass through both devices. I think it's just this first one. I believe that is correct. Okay, I think at this point, we should be good to start this up. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed. We'll go ahead and pull up our VNC window here. And this should be fairly straightforward um, if you followed the first thing. We're basically just going to come in here and install Windows like normal. So yeah, we actually already have this that popped up. What next? Install now. But there is going to be one little trick here. Uh, I don't have a product key. We're going to do Windows 10. Ooh, we could do Windows 10 Pro because I don't have a product key for either one. Yeah, we'll do Windows 10 Pro. Why not? Accept the license terms. And we're going to do a custom install. Uh-oh, we couldn't find any drives. And this is because we don't quite have those vert IO drivers installed just yet. So we have to do a little bit of trickery here. So what we're going to do is head back over to our Proxmox UI. And here under hardware, we're going to swap this guy out really quick. We're going to change this ISO to our vert IO and then hop back over. Okay, we'll hit load driver and then browse. And then here we want to go to, I believe it's this uh, vert IO SCSI and then windows 10 AMD 64. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure why there's two, but we can hit next and we will load this driver. And then with this driver, we should then be able to actually access our virtual drive. Haha, -ha, success. So really quick, we're going to go back to Proxmox here and we're going to swap this back out with our Windows 10 ISO. So we can continue the installation. I'm going to hit new, apply. And this is basically just a Windows install, which I, I imagine most of you are probably fairly familiar with. Um, so I'm going to trust that you can figure out that sounds really condescending. I apologize. Um, yeah, I'm going to let you figure out and get Windows 10 installed, and then I'll meet you back at a clean desktop. I lied. We actually need to set something else up. In the meantime, we're going to minimize this. We are going to head over to our TrueNAS server because we need to set up an iSCSI target. So basically, we're going to have a portion of our NAS our pool that we made in TrueNAS, we're gonna have a portion of that set up as a virtualized drive essentially that we'll use iSCSI to share with our Windows 10 virtual machine for game storage. So we can have basically a dedicated game drive on our NAS that our virtual machine will actually just see as a physical drive. It won't see it as an SMB share or anything. It'll be just a normal drive that games can load off of. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll go to storage here. And then under our prox pool, we're going to click here and hit add zvol. And we're going to call this, um, let's we'll call it game share. And size for this volume, I think we do it in, can we do it in tibby bytes? Cool. Yeah. So we'll do one tebby byte, tibby byte. It's funny how people come after me for saying tebby byte, thinking it's terabyte, and then it's, it's actually a thing. But yeah. So one tebby byte. And then we'll leave this all the same. And then sparse, no. Yeah, we'll leave this all the exact same. I don't think there's anything, yeah. We can leave the block size the same. So we'll leave everything the same minus this, you know, one tip about here. Let's save. And so now we have this volume, but we need to actually share it as an iSCSI target. So I'm going to go to shares. And then we're down here where it says a block iSCSI shares targets. We need to hit configure, I believe. And we're going to hit this wizard up here. And this is going to kind of take us through this. 
So we're gonna create or choose a block device and we're gonna call this game iSCSI, why not? And extent type, we're gonna do device and the device is going to be our game share we just made. Sharing platform, I believe we can do, we'll do modern OS, I'm pretty sure. And then target, we don't have a target, so we're gonna create new. We'll hit next. For portal, we need to create a new. And we don't wanna use chap or anything. Um, this is a little bit unsecure, but I'm not too worried about, about this. So we're just gonna leave authentication as none. And then for add listen, We'll just put this as 0.0.0.0. .0, .0, Next. And I don't believe, yeah, we'll leave this all blank. Yes, we'll leave this all blank. And then hit save. Okay. And we'll hit save here and enable the service. We should be able to go over here to targets and see we have this game iSCSI target now. And if we really wanted to double check, I could do iSCSI initiator here in Windows. Okay, and then with iSCSI initiator, we can go to targets, and we're gonna do 192.168.1.32. Quick connect, and then we have this game iSCSI, and we can hit done. And we actually will probably get a, uh, maybe not, let's see. We go to disk management. Now we can see we must initialize a disk before a logical disk manager can access it. And we're not gonna do that because I'll wait until we're actually in our, we could, but I'm just gonna wait until we're in our new Windows 10. I'm just gonna disconnect from this for now. And we'll come back to that in our Windows 10 machine, which I need to get back to this install. So yeah, I'm going to finish the Windows 10 install and then we'll come right back to this. Okay. So I believe we're in good shape. What we can do here is go to a device manager now that we're in Windows. And hopefully, if we go to display adapters, we do see that we have this NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1650 Super, which is great. And there's a good chance you don't have network right now because we don't have the, well, you don't probably have the um, Vert IO drivers installed. I accidentally installed them um, when I didn't mean to, when I was trying to install, I accidentally installed the network drivers first, not the Vert IO SCSI drivers when we were doing the install. So I already have network access, but um, if we want to give ourselves network access, what we can do, or if, if you don't have network access and you want internet, which you probably do, we can go back over to Proxmox here and under our CD DVD drive, which is still this Windows 10 ISO, we can swap that out once again. And we can open folder to view the files for this guy. And down at the very bottom, there should be this application here. We'll hit agree, install. And this is going to go through and install all of the drivers so that we're not having to worry about having any of the vert IO drivers installed or not installed. We can just run this. It'll install them all for us. Great, and the installation was successful. So our device is showing up. We're not using it currently as our um, GPU, but um, it is in fact working, which is cool. So now I actually kind of want to do, oh gosh, uh, that didn't work. We're gonna do the iSCSI initiator. We're gonna hit yes to run the service. And then we'll type in our, the address of Trunez. Hit done, and that's connected. And so now we can go to disk management and we should get this pop-up. It's letting us know we have a new disk we need to virtualize. So we'll just go ahead and hit um, OK with GPT. And then now you can see we have a little bit over a terabyte because we have our one tebby byte. Um, I should have just done one terabyte. That way it would have been nice and even. But we need to make a new simple volume. And we will call this, let's do G for gaming. 
hit next. And we'll call this game iSCSI. Hit next. Finish. Cool. So now this is super cool. This this is why I enjoy doing stuff like this. Devices and drives. We have our fake hard drive here, which is getting very full. I really should have used a bigger SSD for the boot drive or added another one in for, for more storage here. But we have this whole terabyte of our game iSCSI drive here, which is pretty awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and try something. Oh, no, I'm not. So because we installed Windows 10 Pro, we could use remote desktop management, but I think I'm going to try something a little bit more dangerous. Oh my gosh, start with Outline. Whatever. This is why no one likes your stuff, Microsoft. We're gonna download Parsec. We're gonna download it for Windows 64-bit. We'll run it. Um, I'm going to install this virtual display driver, but I don't think we actually need it because I'm not going to use the paid version of Parsec. So uh, we do want to set this up as shared. That way we can actually sign in using Parsec. We don't have to actually be signed in for Parsec to work, which will be very helpful since we're running this entire machine headless. I didn't say this before, but Parsec is what we use, is what we're going to use to remote into this for, for virtual stuff. So I'm going to exit out of here. Uh, now, I'm not going to show you this, but I am going to use my personal account here. So I'm going to hide this, but yeah, you can go make an account with Parsec and log in. You're smart. You're watching this video. You're smart. Okay, so I am logged in now with Parsec. Okay, just out of curiosity, if I connect here, let's see what happens. Hey, look, looky there. Um, what's going on with my displays here? That's uh, how do I do this? What is it? Okay, Parsec's working. That's that's all we needed to know. So I'm going to disconnect. Okay, back in Proxmox here. I'm just going to go ahead and remove this CD DVD drive, and we're going to shut down our Windows machine here. Okay, and now that it is shut down, well, oh, no, oh, there we go. Now that it's shut down, we want to do a few things. We want to go to this display here and do none. And then go to this PCIe device, and we're going to turn on primary GPU. Hit OK. And we already got rid of our CD DVD drive, so I believe we're good to spin this back up. Fingers crossed. Okay, I'm just gonna hang out over in Parsec here, hitting reload a few times. Okay, nice, hit connect. And we are at the login. Look at this, guys. Eee! Isn't this fun? Isn't this fun? I don't know, this is great, this is awesome. I love this kind of stuff. Okay, so we are remoted into our Windows Virtual Machine. Um, okay, so now we can basically just treat this like, oh, my hotkeys aren't working because I'm in Parsec. We can basically just treat this like it's a Windows machine. We're going to go ahead and install our NVIDIA drivers. We can install Steam. We can do all that kind of stuff. So let's go ahead and uh, I'm just going to do that a little bit off camera. I'm sure you guys know how to install GeForce Experience and all that garbage. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to get a few things installed and I'll meet you back here in just a second. Okay, I think we are all booted back up. We have the NVIDIA drivers installed. We have Steam installed. We have um, a couple games. Actually, I want to show you something really quick. This is actually pretty cool. So we have our game iSCSI here. We also have, I went ahead and mounted um, this proc share, and I have this folder that I copied some um, game files to to make this a little faster. So if I copy this Hollow Knight here, because we're copying from our NAS, which is connected via Vert IO versus you know an actual gigabit connection or anything, when we go copy this into, um, we're, we're kind of copying it. It's a little weird how we're doing this right now, but what you'll see 
is that we're actually getting faster than gigabit or two and a half gigabit speeds here once it gets gets going. And it's kind of a little bit lame because we're copying a bunch of small files here and we're going from our NAS to our virtual machine back to our NAS. But okay, well, this is not as, as cool, as, as impressive as it was a second ago. But what you'll see is that this will actually, this isn't communicating over a gigabit or multi gigabit connection. It's happening over a virtual connection, the, the vert IO. So it's not limited to any sort of spec of um, gigabit or multi gigabit. So pretty cool. It's not as impressive as it was a minute ago. We were getting like 400 megabytes per second, but um, maybe I'll do a little copy here just for fun. Let's actually go back to, um, I was getting some of this stuff set up earlier. I'm gonna copy this movie. It's a little less than a gigabyte, but if I copy this from our NAS over, we'll see that we get, whoa, really fast speeds. You saw that above 600 megabytes per second pretty cool there's no way you'd get that over a two and a half gigabit connection or definitely not a gigabit connection so pretty cool but i'm getting ahead of myself here uh let's see if we can play i feel pretty confident that faster than light is going to work here we'll start easy though i'm a little nervous because we were getting yeah i kind of ran into something um, that i noticed because our cpu is sharing resources with this windows machine as well as our true nas server with fast SSDs comes a lot of CPU overhead. And so we're actually kind of, because our SSDs are so fast, I mean, it's not that fast. There's a lot of crazier stuff, but because they are fairly fast, it's actually using a lot more CPU um, resources than I kind of expected or didn't really think it through. So we could actually run into an issue where our SSDs are so fast that it's throttling our CPU on our gaming machine. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that um, later. We may make some changes. But here we can, uh, yeah, I have no idea what game I was playing here, but um, we are here. We're playing FDL. This is uh, pretty, we're, you know, we're on a local network here, so it's to be expected. Um, we could try doing this over our WireGuard VPN, but we'll see. I might do that and add it to it later, but yeah, so FDL is super, super playable here. Let's get rid of that. Um, let's open up something a little bit more scary, scary, like Doom. Okay, so we are in Doom here. I'll, um, it's a little awkward to pull up my face cam because the shortcuts don't work while I'm in Parsec, but we can pull this up and do a little bit of gaming testing here and see what happens. Yeah, so we're still getting, you know, this is Doom, so it's, you know, fairly easy to run, but we're still getting um, pretty good frames per second here. I don't think you can see, I don't think I can get this mouse to where you can see, but this is a very very responsive parsec's great for this um yeah i'm not having any issues with a uh, lag or anything this is way better than when i did some tests with um steam remote well what's it called the in-home streaming or whatever i'm not sure i'm doing a terrible job that's why i'm not a game streamer but yeah this is uh i would say very playable um there's a couple little um spots where it's you know not the absolute best, but definitely, definitely playable. Latency is actually pretty good. It's not a latency thing. It's just that there's a couple of like stutters and it's not, I'm not entirely sure where that's happening, but yeah, this is pretty, this is pretty cool. Pretty playable. I'm going to go ahead and uh, X the desktop. Yeah. Super playable. Um, I, I know this is only, Doom's pretty lightweight, and I think our biggest limitation is going to be um, CPU because, you know, if we pull up Task Manager here, you can see our CPU is not entirely pegged, but, you know, it's getting up there, um, and our GPU was um, not, not chilling, but definitely not as heavily utilized as our CPU, so, but yeah, so we could do some lightweight gaming. That should work over um, WireGuard. I'll actually might, actually might test that out with um, my MacBook at some point. I just have to be off of my network um yeah so maybe maybe at some point maybe tomorrow at work i can pull up this on the wi-fi and do some game testing or something with parsec so um but for now we're actually going to jump over to installing jellyfin and that is pretty oh my shortcuts aren't working and that is pretty easy all we have to do is uh we can go to the website here i already downloaded this thing but we can go to jellyfin windows installer 
and then you could find the Windows thing, downloads, and then I just did this um, installer here. And I haven't done this before, but it seems fairly easy. So I'm just gonna go to my downloads and run this Jellyfin thing. I have a feeling it's gonna warn me. Yep, run anyway. I'm a man. I can handle the viruses. Okay, Jellyfin set up. I haven't done this before, so this is just me going through it. Basic install recommended. Um, I did see something earlier that if you set it up as service, uh, it could actually run into some issues uh, with hardware acceleration. So I'm going to run this as basic. Now that will kind of stink if the our Proxmox server goes down that you know this Windows machine will automatically log into our Windows machine. So we'd have to log into this, sign into Windows, and then make sure Jellyfin's up and running. So that's a little bit of a bummer, but I want to make sure that hardware acceleration's working. So we're just gonna roll with that. So all right, so we'll install this. We could actually, since it's 200 and it's fine, we have 80 gigs still. So we'll just install it. I was going to say we could install it on our iSCSI, but it's probably not worth the potential issues that could happen there. Okay, I think we're done. We'll hit close. And then, oh, Jellyfin server, it's right here. Okay, we're just going to allow on all networks. Those down here that it's running, it says auto start. That's probably what we want. And I bet if I hit open Jellyfin, okay, yeah, we'll go ahead and pull up a local host, port 8096. And we'll follow this wizard, I guess. So username Haven, super secure password, as always. Uh, and we're gonna add a media library. And what we're gonna do here is I did this while I was waiting on drivers to install and all of that junk, um, but basically, I, I first of all I mounted our not our iSCSI but our SMB share. Um, I mounted that here the same way I did it before on my other desktop, and I went ahead and made this folder called Jellyfin, and then two subfolders: one movies, one shows, and then within shows I went ahead and copied the Office US season one. Um, you can look up on Jellyfin how to label stuff. Um, I copied stuff from Plex, so hopefully it's close enough. And then this is Star Wars A New Hope, but it's the despecialized edition, which is pretty cool. So I just copied a few things over so we'd have something to work with. So we're going to set these up now. So we can do shows, uh, display name shows, and we'll add a folder. So we need to go find this folder, Jellyfin, shows. Oh, interesting, shared network folder. If this folder is shared on your network, find the network path that can allow clients on other devices to access media files directly. Yes, sir, that's what we're gonna do. Okay, so we're gonna do 192.168.1.32 prox share slash jellyfin slash uh, shows, is that it? Okay, so it's capital jellyfin, capital shows. So that should be it. You can hit OK. Oh, I see. I see. So now I'm not sure. I'm going to just do this. I'm curious if this needs to basically line up with this mount point. What? OK. We'll see what happens. Uh, I believe we're just going to leave this all the same. I'm not going to dive too much into this. We'll hit OK. And then we'll add another media library, content type movies. And we'll add a folder. Same thing here. Jellyfin movies. And we'll do this again and see if that works. Hopefully it does. Wish there was a way to confirm. But we'll hit next. This all looks good. Next. Allow remote connections to this server. Um, yeah, we'll do that. Uh, well, hmm. We actually could leave this off and let WireGuard, if we wanted to connect to it via WireGuard, we wouldn't need this to be connected. But I'll leave this, and then I'm not going to worry about port forwarding or port mapping. Um, we'll leave that. And I think we can hit finish, and we will log in here to our user. Don't save it. And it looks like 
we're already getting some good stuff going on here. Uh, I'm going to really quickly check some settings though. I imagine this is going to be under hmm, playback. No, I want oh, administration maybe. General playback hardware acceleration. Here we go. We're going to do NVIDIA NVENC. Enable hardware decoding for, I imagine these are all correct. Maybe MPEG-4 as well, but I think hardware encoding, enable advanced NVENC decoder or NVDEC decoder. I don't know if I need that. I don't think so. I think we just need to make sure that transcoding is selected and then hit save. Um, got it. Now, granted, we don't have anything that's going to really require a hardware acceleration, but yeah, I think we're good. I'm going to go to 192.168. Oh, wait, what's my IP address on this machine? Because that's going to be what we need. I'm actually going to knock that out now. So we're going to go to um, network here, network and internet settings, and then change adapter options. And we have this vert IO adapter. We'll hit properties and then uh, IPv4. Use the following IP address. And we're going to do 192.168.1.33. Subnet mask 255.255.255. Default gateway 192.168.1.1, which is my router. Um, and then we will just, oh, we can't obtain it automatically because we're not using DHCP. Okay. So we'll do 192.168.1.42, which is my D, my pie hole DNS and hit. Okay. Boop. We'll reload parsec connect. Haha. -ha. Okay. And then if we go to like google.com, great. We have DNS. Cool. So now, just out of curiosity, if I were to go to 192.168.1.33, and then, ooh, what is the port? 8096 or 8920? 8096, there we go. And now we are accessing this, uh, I guess technically, no, yeah, we're actually accessing this over the network. I can pull up the office here. I can go to season one, the Alliance, and play this and hopefully not get in trouble here. I'm gonna mute it, but yeah, that's easy. This is a like standard definition, old DVDs, so that's pretty easy to play. This Star Wars here, this should be, I guess it's just 720. So nothing here that's really gonna require transcoding at all, especially not watching this, but it is pretty cool that we have this up and running, and as far as I know, hardware acceleration should be working. I might try this on my phone really quick. Let's let's see what happens. Okay, so I have Wi-Fi deactivated. I just activated my Prox WireGuard tunnel. Yeah, it would help if my WireGuard container was running. I forgot to hit start earlier. Oops, my bad. All right, now it's running. Okay. So you might be able to see this, but we're jelly fended up. All right. And I have Star Wars playing. And I am transcoding. Mm, there's a little bit of a buffer here. When I changed the quality, it was fine until I changed the quality. But okay. Yeah. We got some Star Wars going on here. It's pretty cool. I'm doing that from my own computer. How, is, how cool is that? Isn't technology amazing? Yeah, guys, I think that's about it for this one. Sorry for the loose nature of this, but I did want to make this in a way that wasn't quite as polished as some other videos um, because I wanted you to see the process of how I would figure out how to do some of this stuff. A lot of it is just Google, but um, hopefully it was helpful. Hopefully seeing kind of that process was a bit helpful or at least entertaining, um, or you're just going to rail me in the comments. So have fun with that. 
But let me know in the comment section below what else you'd like to see me potentially do with this server. Um, this server, it's actually the camera tripods sitting on top of it, which is funny. But um, yeah, let me know in the comments what you'd like to see me do with this server moving forward. And yeah, hopefully you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments whether you liked it or not. Let me know with the thumbs up and thumbs down whether you liked it or not. Also, don't forget to check out my Patreon if you'd like to support the channel. I have early access to videos like these, as well as a few behind the scenes things, and you just help me buy stuff like this computer. So maybe check out my Patreon if you'd like. And I think I'm gonna stop talking now because it is fairly late and I'm pretty tired and this video is probably gone way too long. So as always, Thanks for watching, stay curious, and I'll see you in the next one.